Hi everyone. So uh, today I'd like to talk about reactive programming in JavaScript. And before we start with, with that talk, uh, I want to talk more why I created this talk and why I think that this is important. So I have a short story to tell. So now it's story time. Uh, let's say two years ago, I worked hard like this guy on a project. And the project had a lot of user uh, interactivity and a lot of uh, API calls. So I was uh, really thinking, sitting like SpongeBob alone, and thinking, what should I? What can I use to uh, go maybe uh, off from uh, callbacks, promises to something new that will really help me to write more readable and more performant code? And really, after some time, I had that yay moment when I uh, figured out that. Really, reactive programming is something that I should use, and that reactive programming is the key to my success. So after a couple of months of working on that project, I really saw that reactive programming helped me to write better code. The client was, was happy. The project moved on. Uh, we had the first release. Uh, the users were happy. Everyone was great. And I saw that on web, you don't have so many uh, resources uh, about reactive programming. So I wrote an article. Uh, the article was published on SitePoint. I worked with guys uh, from SitePoint to get that done. And it had this title. So why am I switching from React to CycleJS? Uh, CycleJS is a library for uh, reactive programming. We will uh, see. Uh, we will, I will speak more about that later. And uh, the article became really popular. So. Um, uh, it was uh, featured on many websites, it was in many newsletters, and it was also translated on Russian and even Chinese. And I was checking the comments and uh, wanted to see what people think about reactive programming and, and this article, and uh, people just wanted to fight in, in, the, in the comments. Uh, they were like, you know, don't touch my React. Uh, I have a React tattoo. I'm using it every day. And <laughs> uh, some of them were like, oh, yeah, I just came here to read comments and, and to see that. And I figured out later that people really didn't see the point of, of my work and the article. I didn't want to, to make a fight. I just wanted to share something new. And that made me really sad. Uh, so that's why I'm here today. I want to try to change that, and I want to help you uh, see what's reactive programming and why it helped me, and maybe it can help you. So uh, I'm Ivan. I work at Nearform, and you can find me on Twitter and on my blog, where I write about stuff. Uh, yeah, people don't argue on my blog. I'm, I'm kind there. <laughs> so Let's see, the first question, so what is reactive programming? How many of you are, know now what's uh, reactive programming? Oh, cool, how many of you use it? Maybe now. How many of you use it uh, out of uh, Angular? So, just reactive, oh, yeah, just small amount of people. Yeah, now uh, reactive programming is becoming popular because it's one of the components in the latest Angular versions, but I won't speak about that. So the reactive programming, what's that? So reactive programming is a programming with a synchronized data streams. And this is a definition that I like on, on that you, uh, web. You can find a lot of definitions. And this one is from Anders Staltz. Uh, you can learn a lot from, from this guy. Just Google him. And from this definition, we know so what's programming, what's asynchronized. Uh, one thing that we don't know now is what is a da data stream. So what's a data stream? Uh, data stream, simply said, is an endless sequence of digital signals or data packets. So just a stream where, and inside that stream, it can, there could can be anything, so any JavaScript object, any number, strings, whatever. And it looks like this. So here we have endless data streams of just numbers starting from 60, 50, 40, and so on. And this is fine for now. Uh, Let's see what's in JavaScript reactive programming. So in, in JavaScript reactive programming is abstraction over all async processes that uh, we have into a data stream. So that sounds really nice. Um, you know, everything in, in, so most of the things in JavaScript are async. And uh, people write a lot of code to, to handle uh, that. 
And uh, if you could use one API and one code for handling all async processes, that would be really awesome. So let's see how can we do it. Uh, as an example here, I took um, user clicks. And let's see how can we handle that in, in JavaScript uh, as uh, data streams. So here we have one stream of data. And here user clicked three times, then he waited let's say, a second, then he clicked twice and waited, and then clicked only once. We can easily create a buffer from, and we, we want to merge those uh, clicks into buffers. Uh, if they happened in uh, 500 milliseconds. So we have one buffer with three clicks, then we have one buffer with two clicks, and we have a buffer with one click. So we created something that we can work with. Now, what next can we do? We can map. So we can transform and create a new stream from this one into something new. So map through all buffers and get size of the buffer and uh, output the, the number. So we have three two, and one. We can also filter. For example, uh, you want to filter where the number is uh, more or equal than two. So we get uh, does this one, uh, three and two, and one was drop out. And every time we create a new stream, so there is uh, no uh, data mutation. Now, uh, obvious question. Uh, I s uh, I've shown you uh, what is a data stream and how uh, simply, can you work with the data stream in JavaScript? So why do you need this React thing? First thing, it's good for external service calls. Uh, I've used reactive programming mostly for uh, on websites where I have a lot of API calls, where I have web sockets, where I have a lot of uh, third-party async calls to handle them. And it's uh, really easy when, when you have some reactive uh, library. Next thing, performance. So I saw that, and you can see, you can see uh, benchmarking on a bunch of uh, websites that uh, when you compare, for example, promises with uh, hand some, so handling some API requests with promises uh, or handling API requests with some reactive library, uh, it's a bit faster. So if you're maybe working on, on some monitoring system and you have like 100 graphs that should be automated in real time, uh, you will gain better performance if you use some reactive library. Next thing, it's uh, highly testable, so, and it's really easy to test it. Uh, there is no data mutation. It, uh, you will just write functions uh, where the input is uh, some stream and the output is uh, stream that you created. So you can simply test that. Uh, just make a unit test, uh, put a couple streams inside, and see what will happen. So expect some, uh, some streams to, to be returned from a function. Uh, the most important things, so abstraction over, over all async processes. Everything that's uh, async uh, will be handled using the same API. You will read the same documentation for handling user clicks or web sockets or HTTP. A, uh, API, and you will be able maybe to reuse uh, some of that code too. Uh, next thing, it's predictable code. So predictable code is code that you can understand just by re reading it. So you don't need to execute to see what will really happen. Uh, the re uh, so the code that you will write with some reactive library will be really predictable, uh, since it will be really simple to understand uh, what happens there. And ex uh, expandable. So you can extend, uh, just compose uh, the functions uh, that are uh, simply pure functions. And if you're familiar with the functional programming, you can just really easy uh, put one function inside another, and you can extend your code. And later on, so since it's just a data stream of data, uh, you can also you can always just add one more function uh, that will listen to that stream and that will do something to that stream. Uh, if you ever uh, wanted to, to, if you ever re read something about uh, reactive programming, you probably saw this term observable and observer. So the observable is just an official terminology for the stream. When you, whenever you see observable, that's just a stream, and we just have that fancy name observable uh, for it. And the observer is uh, just a subscriber to that stream, and it reacts to whatever comes uh, into that stream. 
So the uh, observable is a string that will come to your function, and the observable is, is the code inside your, your function. Uh, and that code is subscribed to a stream, and it will react and do something uh, whenever uh, something comes into, into a stream. So uh, reactive programming in uh, JavaScript. I have a listed a couple libraries that you can use. The most popular one is RJS. Uh, if you use Angular, you probably have heard uh, for RJS. It's now one of the components there, and this is the logo. So uh, the RJS is the most popular library. I think it's, a, it's the biggest, and it's probably mostly maintained. Uh, and yeah, if you if you work on something smaller, uh, maybe it will be just be uh, an overload to just bundle uh, everything because uh, you probably won't use uh, all those methods. Uh, next thing, Mojs.js. Uh, they claim that they have the best performance, and they have some numbers to prove it. So you can see benchmarking on their, web their website. Uh, it's the library is not that big, uh, but it's nice. And if you really want to have uh, good performance, you can go with Mojs.js. Uh, Bacon.js. It's also a mature library. It's well known, uh, so you can go with, with it too. And Xtreme. So Xtreme is uh, created by Anders Stalt, so the, the guy from the first slides. And it's the smallest one. So I think it has like 20 uh, methods inside. And that's really enough uh, to start with for some medium sized apps. Uh, if, you, if you just want to uh, some regular stuff from the uh, reactive programming, you can go with this one. It's small enough, the documentation is good. Uh, so. Let's go to, as the article said, to React, and let's let's blame React. Yeah, uh, just kidding. So I want to to speak more uh, to say, yeah, uh, what are some uh, React cons since it's the most popular library uh, right now? What are the rea uh, general React cons, and why it's not why the React is uh, just the name? It's the, the doesn't do anything with the reactive programming. Uh, so inside React, uh, the data flow is problem. It's a well-known problem. Everyone's trying to solve that. We have Redux, a uh, bunch of other uh, modules that uh, help us to uh, to work with data in in React. Uh, then side effects. So React is not natively supporting uh, any side effects. So you need to use Sagas or Thunk or whatever else there to 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 handle uh, all those side effects. And the functional programming. So uh, React is not made with the functional programming principles. You have more object-oriented stuff. You have bindings classes. And that's what you probably already know. So I want to show you this. Uh, if you want to make uh, React reactive, uh, you can just use RJS, and it will work uh, great. Uh, inside React, you can just import RJS and, and methods, create your observer, observers. And uh, just put stream inside, and everything will be uh, fine. Or I also recommend using uh, React with Redux, and then plus RJS. So all, if you're familiar with uh, Redux and uh, actions reducers, uh, your uh, every act. So between uh, actions and reducers, you you can have a middleware that's RJS, and every act, so there will be a stream of actions. So you can intercept every action, uh, create one more stream that will do the HTTP request or anything that's async, and then return that back uh, to the stream, and the, read, uh, the reducer will then read from the streams and save the data. Uh, that sounds a bit complicated. So you have React, you have one more library, then you add one big library at the top. Uh, so for the UI and for the front end, there's something else that I want to recommend now. That's Cycle.js. So that's a library from the article that I've written. It's made by Anders Taltz, uh, the guy from the first slides. And Cycle.js is a functional and reactive JavaScript framework for predictable code. So it's exactly the thing that we want uh, when we work with uh, a reactive programming. So we want something that's functional, that's reactive, and that made for the predictable code. Uh, you don't want to put anything on top to make um, library reactive. You want something that's already uh, reactive. So Cycle.js pros, the thing that were cons uh, with React, they are pros here. So the data flow, have explicit data flow uh, 
uh, the name is Cycle.js, so you can already imagine that uh, data is just uh, cycling around and uh, circling. So you, you will have the data that's uh, coming from the UI, then you do something with the data, and you're returning back to the UI. Same thing with the HTTP request with the web sockets. So just circling around and putting um, pure functions on top of that that will do some data modification. Uh, then side effects, uh, it's really simple to, to work with side effects. So just connect uh, your uh, Cycle.js uh, Cycle app to DOM or to WebSocket, and uh, everything else will be done automatic. Uh, you will just add functions that will receive data and work with it. And functional pro programming, so everything inside Cycle.js is a pure function. Uh, some more features. Uh, uh, when it comes to cycle uh, js uh, it's functional so i just said it's just pure functions and streams uh, there's no binding no classes uh, it's reactive as uh, the definition said uh, it's testable so functional programming uh, paradigm says that everything should be highly testable uh, then composable so just compose functions, uh, just compose uh, components that you create. And as I said, it has uh, explicit data flow. So uh, data will just circling around the app. And uh, it's made for, for a large code basis. So the core uh, code organization is really simple. Uh, since it's just uh, just pure functions, you just need to have just one file for every component, and that's it. You don't need anything else on top of that. So you will have a small amount of code, and then small amount of of uh, files, and it's really uh, easy to navigate when you create something complex there. How's the cycle just working? So this is uh, from official website, and. As you see, data flow is just circling around. Uh, here are the, uh, so they, they call it the drivers. Uh, it's DOM, HTTP, or anything else can be a driver. And from the drivers, we send streams as sources into our main function. And then from a main function, we just return the, the streams back to our drivers to re-render the DOM or to send more HTTP requests or update WebSockets. And here, inside the main function, we have a pure data flow. So we have some streams that came in. We created new streams from them and just returned them back. So everything just circling around. Uh, this is how Cycle.js uh, looks like. So just one method. It has just run. And then you pass your, your main uh, function, so the main component. And you just pass an object of drivers, so uh, the drivers that you want to connect to. And that's it. Uh, the drivers, so anything that's coming from the side uh, is a driver. There are uh, a bunch of them already created, so the HTTP one, the DOM, WebSocket, local storage, HTML, uh, file notification, uh, history API, and so on. Uh, if you start with this and if you don't find a driver that works for you, you can really easily create it. It's really simple. Uh, what are the official packages? So the Cycle.js is coming with DOM uh, package. It's a collection of uh, drivers that work with DOM. And it has a virtual DOM uh, based on the Snap DOM uh, library. Uh, it can also work with JSX. You just need to update Babel uh, to, to transpile uh, JSX. Uh, next thing, history. So driver for the history API, if you want to add some uh, routes, I mean, you'll probably uh, I want to do that. Uh, then HTTP, so it's a driver for HTTP request. It's based on super agent. Uh, we have isolate, so that's a small method that helps us to uh, make a scope uh, data flow components. So uh, you will create those functions that uh, are rendering some, uh, some stuff and that are uh, doing something, and you want them to render, uh, you want to render them inside your main function. So you will use isolate for that to just pass the streams that you want uh, to those components and to receive the streams that they uh, return. And it has those three run uh, methods. So run, uh, the, the, the one that I've shown you, is um, 
function for the apps made with the Xtreme. So Cycle.js is a small library, and you need to put some uh, reactive uh, library on top of it. I recommend Xtreme since it's the smallest, and the Cycle.js is also small. Uh, then when you combine them, you create a, a small bundle of dependencies. Uh, if you want to use Most.js, you can use Most Run. Uh, it's official pa package from Cycle.js 2. Or if you want something bigger, uh, RJS, there is uh, RJS run uh, that you can use to create an apps with RJS. Uh, next thing, so there is a new pattern called uh, model view intent that the creators of Cycle.js created. It's just a way how to organize the code inside your components. Uh, this is our main fun function. It has some source. It returns a sync, so that's, again, a stream. Uh, and you will, people always create a mess in, inside the functions. Uh, there's a simple pattern that you can use uh, called intent model view to uh, organize your code. So intent is a part of the code that's just reading from the stream and preparing that for, for something, that, uh, to preparing that, the, the stream to be worked on. Then the model is the code that uh, works on the stream. And the view is the code that updates the stream and adds uh, uh, virtual DOM functions on top of that and preparing that to be returned back to the DOM. Uh, I have a code for a simple counter uh, app. So something like this, decrement, increment, label counter, and uh, zero at the start. Uh, so this is code uh, that's, that's working. So just this, 28 lines, to create the uh, simple counter app. So uh, at the top, we need uh, extreme, we need run, uh, and we need div button, paragraph, and make DOM driver from cycle.js DOM. At the bottom, uh, we have this run method. Uh, it takes the main, uh, main function and an object of drivers. So DOM driver and make DOM driver method, we want to connect uh, to uh, some div with the ID uh, DOM. And then we have this main function, uh, which is separated into model view intent, so those three parts. And then, then at the bottom, we return uh, our stream back to the DOM. So this is first thing, intent, how it works. Uh, we, want, we are taking sources.dom uh, from the DOM, and we want to prepare that uh, for the next step. So we create an action stream. There's a dollar sign at the end. That, that's by the convention. That's how we uh, name the variables that represent streams, just for uh, easier readability. And here we want to merge our uh, stream. So uh, here we will uh, get a stream. Uh, we select a button with the uh, class decrement and with increment. So those are two streams. Uh, we just listen for events, click, and we're mapping those events to uh, minus one or plus one, depending if it's uh, decrement or increment. And since those are uh, two streams, we want to merge them into one. It's uh, always a good idea to merge everything into one stream, since it's much easier uh, to work uh, with just one stream. And uh, here, so events will just return uh, us a buffer. Uh, and we want to, to map that to a number. Uh, always easier to work with numbers. Then on, in a model, uh, we take that action uh, variable stream, and we fold that. So uh, simply, it's the same thing like uh, array re uh, reduce. Uh, there is accumulator and an x. Accumulator, uh, the, the first value is 0, and the x is the current uh, value that uh, came into the stream. So we, we just want to sum that, and we create the count uh, stream. So the count stream will first start from zero, depending if it's a decrement or increment event, it will decrease or uh, increase. And then we have view. So uh, then uh, here we have count that's just a stream of numbers. We want to return that back to DOM. So we need to uh, append some uh, virtual DOM methods. We map through the, the count. Uh, we have the, the count number, and we just return uh, function div with two buttons, and paragraph uh, with some label, and count here. And at the bottom, we return that 
to a DOM. So this uh, VDOM uh, variable is uh, being returned back to the DOM, and Snap DOM will just render that. Uh, looks like this. Simple. Uh, and behind, the data is just circling around, uh, and everything is just a stream. So even the, the view is a stream. Uh, if you want to add CSS, that's also simple. You just create a style object and put that as a second uh, argument here. So this is a, actually coming from uh, SnapDOM. It's CSS in JS. So just pass style. Here is an object. You can pass some other parameters here too inside this object. And that's it for, uh, for this part. Uh, so we now saw that we can handle, uh, simply handle some events that are coming from the DOM. Uh, next thing, how to handle HTTP requests. So as I said, here we want to, to have, <coughs> in reactive programming in JavaScript, we want to have one simple API that will work with everything, so with everything that's async. Uh, so let's see how we handle uh, HTTP uh, requests. At the top, we again import uh, those. So the first three lines are the same. And we also want HTTP uh, driver from cycle HTTP. So we can return it, uh, we can run, um, pass that into the run method at the bottom. And we create a HTTP driver that's doing uh, HTTP uh, requests. Sorry. Uh, so uh, inside our main method, we again uh, have uh, split the, the code. So at the top, we have this request stream. Here we just say to Xstream to create a, um, a stream and to send every uh, second to send to put one uh, buffer uh, on that stream, and we map, map that buffer to, uh, buffer to uh, an object with some URL where we want to send uh, API requests. Uh, there, this object can also ha have a method. The default one is get. We can put a, a post and put a body also. And we specify a category. Uh, since the all HTTP requests will, will come back as one stream, uh, we want some easy way to filter uh, that stream. Uh, since uh, if, we, if we also fetch some images, we will be also able to see them inside the, say the main function. So later on, we just want to, s to filter uh, buffers that have category API. Uh, here is the VDOM stream. So we take. Uh, we just uh, select everything. Sorry, so we just select uh, uh, s uh, buffers with the category API. Uh, we flatten that, so there uh, there will be multiple streams coming. We just want to flatten them into one to e easier work with that. We map uh, response, take the body. Uh, we start with uh, there is this code starts with it's for. Uh, so here, the result response, uh, it, it, we don't want to, to write undefined. So uh, before, on the first render, there won't be any HTTP request sent. So we want to start with something. We say response should be empty uh, on the, the first render. And we map those buffers into div with the h2 uh, header. And we say response from the server is this one. At the bottom, uh, we need to return our DOM back, and we need to return HTTP. So that's uh, this one. So request, we want to return it back. So the, uh, the Cycle.js will start sending uh, requests. Uh, how we work with components here? Uh, it's so simple. Uh, everything is a function, so just put one function uh, inside another, and you create your uh, component view. Uh, the main uh, function uh, will receive sources and ret return syncs. And then here, somewhere we will need to just take sources that we want, send them to our uh, subcomponent, and then we will receive syncs from that subcomponent so we can return them back here. Uh, this is a simple code, so isolate method coming from uh, Cycle.js. You create sources <coughs> excuse me, uh, that are coming from um, to a main uh, function, uh, you create your child component. Uh, it's basically uh, calling us isolate passing component and the sources. And here uh, you get uh, from child component you get some uh, streams back. 
you can take them. So it's a VDOM, for example, or any other value that you want to receive from that component. It can be some calculation inside. And everything that um, child component returns uh, will be a stream. Uh, what are the CycleJS cons? So there are always some cons, and this is not an ideal uh, framework. Uh, it's a community, so it's not that new framework uh, library. It's there for a couple of years, but the community is, is still small. It's not like Angular or React. And, uh, but uh, there are not so many modules that support it, uh, but it's easy to, to create one and to just publish that and uh, give back to a community. Um, Learning new paradigm. Uh, so the reactive programming is hard uh, to start with. And uh, without that, you, you, you cannot work with CycleJS. You, you will need to spend some time uh, to find resources and to learn uh, how to use it. And of course, some apps don't need to be reactive. If you're building uh, some simple website or a blog, uh, there's not so many uh, user activity. There's probably just one. Uh, API endpoint to, to fetch all articles, and that's where you just don't need CycleJS. It's not made for that. It's made with more uh, side effects, with more interactivity in the app. So the conclusion of the talk is uh, reactive programming is uh, all paradigm uh, with uh, now uh, new usage. So from, I think from the uh, it comes from the 90s. Uh, but uh, till now, we didn't really use uh, reactive programming. Uh, it's not for everyone. As I said, uh, sometimes your apps uh, don't need to be uh, reactive at all. Uh, it's uh, perfect for real-time apps that require high performance. So I was building a monitoring system for 300 uh, microservices that we use, and basically sending uh, requests uh, to more than 300 API endpoints, and it has 300 graphs. So uh, with CycleJS, that was really simple, and it's, it worked, worked perfectly. Uh, it's uh, reactive programming, so testable, and we want testable and uh, predictable code, and we want to have one uh, interface for all our async processes. So what to do next? Uh, just go to cyclejs.org. Uh, you have uh, good documentation there. Uh, it's this one. It uh, has uh, this on the side, so you, you can see how to start with and create some simple apps. Uh, for also learn, learning uh, RJS and uh, everything around, so all those methods that are coming with RJS and all other uh, libraries also uh, have them. You can go to rxmarbles.com. It's an interactive website. Uh, basically, uh, you have a uh, list of methods uh, on the left. Uh, here, you can move uh, all those uh, buffers. Uh, you have two streams, and you will then see immediately the result uh, that, that will be uh, returned from the merge method if you send those two uh, streams. So it's easier for learning if you start with this and you don't remember how, for example, merge working. You can always come here, and without reading any documentation, you will immediately see what should happen to your streams. And one uh, nice thing that I found uh, a couple months ago is that a guy uh, called Jan, he created uh, an app to read uh, satellite test data. So he has some um, small... Uh, gadgets uh, for uh, measuring uh, temperature or other things. And he just created a simple CycleJS app. He wrote a WebSocket DOM, uh, WebSocket driver, and he's just communicating with his uh, small satellites uh, and uh, reading uh, the data from them using WebSockets. And uh, he created a small website to, to just uh, see all the data in real time in, in graphs. So that's one use case of uh, CycleJS and the reactive programming. And yeah, that's everything I wanted to, to tell you. You can find me on Twitter and on my blog. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. All right, we have a few questions for you, if you'll join yeah. me here. Yeah, all right, so. 
you touched on some of this, but one of the questions was what are the cons of using reactive programming and when would you not want to use it? So you mentioned yeah, you know, if exactly. you don't have a highly interactive site, but like exactly. what's the threshold? Yeah, yeah it should be. I mean, also, it, what are the people with React tattoos saying? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got some emails. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, I mean, this is, you, you're, t you're telling that something new is better from. Uh, then react, you know, uh, you're not right and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. They were kind of nice, yeah. but you know, <laughs> that wasn't my point. I mean, I didn't want to to say that right. react is bad. I use it every day. So, but so on the in the scale of a not a non-interactive site to interactive site, like where do you think? Uh, we're not sure what. So you're the mean. question was, you know, when would you not use it, and you. Like, what are the cons, and when would you not use reactive programming? And you mentioned if you don't have an interactive site, but okay, what's yeah, so, that threshold? So, uh, really? so uh, I'm using, I'm not using reactive programming uh, all the time. So you can just use callbacks uh, or promises, and you can handle everything in in your Angular or React app. But when it comes to some uh, more readable code, and when you're maybe when you have a lot of charts, for example or uh, you have a lot of interactivity. Uh, it can also work with, with promises, uh, but I would go uh, in, with reactive programming path and RJS, uh, for example, when you, when you want to have um, some async events uh, coming from, that's what Angular really uh, uses, uh, RJS, to asynchly communicate uh, and send data across components. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so you also touched on this, though, but the interoperability with other reactive libraries for CycleJS specifically. Oh, yeah, uh, CycleJS is uh, not really, really uh, it's a reactive library, but it just used uh, as a UI library. You always need to put something on top, so or RJS or e Xtreme or BaconJS or MoseJS or uh, anything like that. Uh, CycleJS is just like, I think, 160 lines uh, of code that just helps you to to uh, integrate your uh, any React library with and create a website from that. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. And then lastly, what about server side rendering in CycleJS? Uh, yeah, didn't I didn't do that? So I'm not sure. So probably it. I mean, definitely can work. Uh, I didn't really th think about that. But yeah, if someone has that question, we can maybe chat later. I will try to find something. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.